Hi, I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. I'm here with a good friend, Dr. Artie Kavanaugh from the University of California, San Diego. Artie, how's it going? Going good so far. Yeah. Uh, are you working from home or are you going in and out? A little bit of both. Uh, televisits, which I, I just do not like. Um, and less inpatient, less in-person visits, but uh, still trying to get things done. A lot of emails. You know, I've said for years that practicing, med practicing medicine over the phone is dangerous, puts you, the physician, at risk. But now we're forced to practice by phone or by video. And I don't know if the video makes us that much better, but we, we are in the time of corona. We've got to get through this. Um, so one of the things that we're hearing repeatedly is, you know, should I, doc, should I stop my medicine? I even heard doctors now going to maybe less medicine as a way of dealing with less visits or some other limitations. For instance, Eric Ruderman talked in a great video about how they had to change their infusion suite by maybe doing infusions a little less frequency, a little less frequent, like for drugs like Ectemera or Orencia or for Benlista. And, and that's because they have reduced staffing, reduced numbers of infusion um, chairs, but they have to cope. So there's a, there's a big issue about stopping drugs. So um, first off, there's what's your take on this and how are you handling this when you get this question? Well, I think it's the probably the most common my chart question that we get. And it's a, a whole group of different people because people are on all sorts of medications, some of them strongly immunosuppressive, some of them really mildly immunomodulatory. And then, of course, it's the individual person and the comorbid conditions they have, which are probably the most important to the their ultimate outcome. But it's a very common question. I have kind of it's getting to be a boilerplate. I tell them that Regrettably, there's not data that informs the decision so that they have to balance the potential risk, which you can't say there, there may not be, uh, but if they practice the good isolation, hopefully that will be minimized. But there's also the risk of stopping the medication. And on that, uh, we, we have some great history in rheumatology. So I just like to review a little bit of that. There's a a beautiful study from uh, the, the Canadian hydroxychloroquine study group, they called it. And it was a, a, a lovely design. It was a lupus study, patients with lupus on hydroxychloroquine who were doing well. And they said, what happens if you stop? So it was randomized discontinuation like the pediatric rheumatologists like to do. And they found that uh, it is a, actually a beautiful study, very small, 47 uh, or, or 25 versus 22 patients, so 47 patients total. Of the 25 patients who uh, stayed on the Plaquenil, nine had some sort of flare, so 36%. But among those who stopped, 16 of 22 did, so 73%. And that included many more serious flares. So hydroxychloroquine getting a lot of press now as a potential therapy for COVID or for patients with COVID infections, uh, should our lupus patients just uh, stop it and give it to their moms or their sister or their mailman, uh, there is the risk that you will flare. And I think that's something that we have to be aware of. The risk of stopping effective medicine is that the disease may flare. Uh, getting all historical, there was another, I think the, the premier or the, the original tapering and discontinuing study in rheumatoid arthritis, which that's, of course, a very hot topic these days, but the Tenvoldi study from the Netherlands, which Ferry Breedville was actually second author on. This is published in The Lancet in 1996, and they took people with rheumatoid arthritis in deep remission for a prolonged period of time and randomized them to, to continue the medicine or to stop it. Uh, and these were some old medicines. There was chloroquine. There was D-penicillamine. There was sulfazalazine. Remember, you know, in the in the 80s, methotrexate wasn't that much of a thing. And what they found over a year is that there were about twice as many flares among those who stopped, even though they were in deep remission, 38%, compared to 22% of people who flared, even though they were on their medication. So a lot of more modern studies uh, that address this as well. But if you stop your medication or you cut the dose, there is a chance you could flare. And there's a uh, hope that you would get back to where you were before you tapered or stopped, but that doesn't always come fast and that's not always guaranteed. So the, the downside here is that people will flare. When people say, well, if they flare, then I can manage them, you know? 
But they, you know, we're seeing a lot more studies in the last few years about the, da the damage incurred by flares. It could be the ugly uh, side of rheumatology and rheumatoid arthritis management, especially that uh, really we're not really dealing, dealing well with. Um, so I worry about flares, especially a 50% flare rate in these kind of patients. Yeah, and there's uh, there's so many studies. There's uh, there's uh, retro, um, there's the the optima. There's uh, uh, dozens of studies in rheumatoid arthritis. One consistent theme is we have no idea who we can taper. Uh, we know some people seem to. There's a great study from Europe that they presented at ULR in 18, and they were forced by the government to cut down on the dose. And I think it's a nice study. It's 150 people, and they found that 40% um, of them couldn't taper. They start to taper, and the disease acts up. 15% came off drug, and the rest were split between a half and two-thirds dose. But there was absolutely no way to predict who could do that. And I tell my patients that if they want to try to taper or want to stop, especially in this era where we have such worries, that that's a concern, that they may flare. You know, these trials, which were done in the last decade, were the, the forced um, withdrawal trials or the programmed withdrawal trials you might, might best return them as programmed you know, disaster trials because only bad things happen. It was seen in JIA, it's been seen in pregnancy. Women who get pregnant on TNF inhibitors stay on it. Women who go off their TNF inhibitors when they become pregnant, clearly those who stay on do way better and there's no downside to continuing. Um, the JESMER study, patients who were not doing well on methotrexate were then randomized to methotrexate alone, I'm sorry, methotrexate plus Embrel or Embrel alone. If they stayed on a drug that wasn't working, they did way better. They had less x-ray damage. They had less disease activity at the end. Uh, so I think we're imploring our colleagues that even though it seems like mild medicine, maybe withdrawing or stopping Plaquenil, um, there, there are grave consequences to this, and we should really be safeguarding the patient's safety during this sort of trying period. Yeah, and going way back before we had the highly effective therapies we have now for many of our diseases, Uncontrolled raging systemic inflammation is also immunosuppressive, and immunosuppressive. And there, you know, the old epidemiologic studies of, of active RA show that those patients were at a greater risk of infection than the age and sex matched population. So, uncontrolled systemic inflammation is not just something that you can say, "Oh, they'll put up with it." And uh, what do we do when people do flare? We give them steroids, and the steroids are, you know. Um, always about the worst when it comes to risks for infections, including some viral infections. So I've heard a few docs say, you know what, it's probably not a bad idea to withdraw or lessen therapy because, you know, lupus, the non-adherence rate to black is, um, is, is as much as 80% and as little as 40%. And then the same can be said for non-adherence to biologics and, and our other DMARDs. And then plus patients who go on these drugs, the withdrawal rates are roughly about 10% a year. And, you know, we kind of live through all of that, but this is different. Here you're making a big choice to actually do the wrong thing. Yeah, and and that's exact. I agree completely. At the end of the day, it's really up to the patient. And um, it's dissatisfying to us that we're not able to give them better data to say what would be the best choice. It's really a, a personal decision. Well, it's even more dangerous because the patients are already pre-programmed and want to take less medicine. Now they got an out because they're in the news is telling them they're immunosuppressed. You shouldn't be on Talk to your doctor. And they're making decisions, you know, on their own. And it's, I think it's our, uh, our responsibility to guide them through some really difficult decisions. Yeah, ab right. absolutely. All right, Artie. Thanks so much for this. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care. Thanks, uh, everybody out there in the room now.